Okay, you're here on CMAG before the show, and I'm sitting with my guest, Christina. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited that you're able to come on the podcast because we've been talking a while now about you know some of your ideas for music making and, and just say a little bit more about what you're up to. You're doing a lot of work here in the greater New York City area, so what do you do on a daily basis? Yeah, uh, well, I like to start all the way from the beginning, like how I got involved in music. Okay. Um, so, honestly, I don't have like a specific date when I started, a specific year. I remember uh, elementary school, they started with the recorders, and then I liked, um, always been, was a big fan of music, like that. And then um, in fifth grade, I played the clarinet for a year. And then in middle school, I did uh, play trombone for two years. And then I didn't. I stopped playing music just because I didn't see myself uh, going into band. I just like kind of died down with that. But I did still love the music aspect of it. So I did musical theater in high school because I was a part of the theater program. And then in college, I studied uh, music and sound recording, so basically engineering, how to do my own music and all that stuff. And then I'm here, music and arts. Um, my musical journey has, like, its ups and downs just because um, I did start songwriting when I was 10. Um, don't remember the first song I wrote, but it was just something, like, so simple. And then... Um, at 16, I started taking more into, like, a seriousness to it. So I, I, like, actually have a binder of all these songs that I wrote. And then when I got my first iPad, I started writing songs on my iPad, too. Um, and it just, like, kind of died down when I started college because I, I, like, I don't, honestly don't know what happened in that, like, space. I guess I was, like, so concentrated on, like, getting my major, getting my degree, even though it was, like, focusing on music, but it's just, like, the motivation wasn't there. Um, but from time to time, I would just, like, write little phrases, or in my head I would, like, improvise something. I'm like, oh, this sounds good. I should put it on my phone. So even though I'm, like, not fully writing songs, I still have, like, little, like, thoughts that I put on my phone and look back to it time to time and see, like, hmm, maybe I can add something more to it. Uh, currently, right now, I'm working in music and arts. I'm a senior sales associate, so basically I help kids with finding their um, music, finding their sound and their instrument. Uh, I am playing around. Uh, I have Logic on my Mac computer. I play around from time to time just to uh, see what Logic has sound-wise and uh, sound effects-wise. Play around, see what I like and I don't like. Um, moving forward, I am interested in finding like studio work because I really that's what I liked about my major we were able to work in studios and create our own projects so I definitely want to be more part of the creative process than the business side so um, I've actually been communicating with this uh, guy like he's interested he's doing his own projects and he's interested in finding like a sound engineer and I told him I have a degree in it and I'd be more than happy to help you out and see what um, you're looking into but yeah that's that's where I am right now. Wow, I didn't know all of this about you. It seems <laughs> like you've done everything in music. And so sound engineering, that's huge. So do you see yourself maybe doing some projects that involve film work or more just studio work? Where do you see yourself headed as a sound engineer? Do you want to work with live production versus recorded production? Or And then you mentioned the creative side. Do you see yourself writing music for a film or something like that? So I definitely do see myself being more part of the creative side, just the recording creative side, not live production. Okay. Um, just because I love being a part of the process and seeing how it's made. Um, composing, I like never thought of it, even though like in my head I'm always thinking of like melodies and and beats and all that stuff but like I have this thing where I have something in my head but I always forget to like put it out but it's like still stuck in my head and I'm like I have to like put it somewhere so I either like record myself singing the melody or I just like again playing with logic um I do the melody myself uh but definitely see myself uh doing more of the recording session I would love to like compose my own stuff Definitely having that freedom of doing my own thing and having people appreciate it for it. 
because I think of music like a canvas, like a blank sheet as a canvas, and you're the artist, and you paint whatever you want, or in my case, I write whatever I want, and then, like, people tend to like it because they see, like, that individuality, that genuine aspect of it. Um, wouldn't mind collaborating as well, um, but definitely having that sense, like, oh, this is mine, and, like, if people like it, they like it because it's mine. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's interesting because I think I only knew from just our conversations that you were a singer and then you had the sound engineering mm-hmm. education under your belt. Yeah. But I didn't know about all this other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that you wrote your own music. Yeah. So, wow, but where does the singing come in? You didn't really talk that much about the singing part, but I was impressed yeah. when I first spoke to you about the singing when you told me the songs that you like to sing. Yeah. So can you say a little bit more about that? Um, singing, I honestly don't know where it came from. Part of me feels it came from, like, my grandmother and my mother because, like, I would hear them sing, and they have, like, such beautiful voices. My grandma, who uh, passed away a year ago, she has, like, such a wonderful voice, and my mom, too. So, I don't know, just one day I was just, like, singing, and people were like, oh, you have such a good voice. I'm like, wow, I didn't notice. And this was me, like, in, like, maybe 9, 10, and then I did choir in middle school as well, and I just enjoyed it a lot, and then also high school doing musical theater, what I loved about musical theater is that I was able to sing, and then in college as well, I took um, singing classes, they taught me how to sing in a studio, and also how to like project my voice, so it's singing has been there for as long as like I can remember it's something that I enjoy to this day I still do it even if like I'm blasting music in my car and I'm always singing along to it it's just I don't know it's just something I've always I've always had right and and what was one of the who are some of your influences for singing who are some of your influences I thought I heard you mention an artist but I want you to say it so so Alicia Keys is like my top when I was a teenager um, listening to her sing and play the piano that inspired me to sing as well and like learn a little bit of piano I kind of fell off the piano track but I again it's one of those things I do want to get back to Um, and then as I got older I really like loved women who had such powerful prominent voices like Demi Lovato, Florence Welch from Florence the Machine, Adele, um, and then some um, women from like the 60s and 70s as well, even early 30s, um, and the James. Amy Winehouse was also like one of my favorite um, women. So I just was a huge fan of women who had these like nice powerful voices, not necessarily that they could hit the high notes, but it's like when you listen to their music, like, you can feel, like, their pain, their happiness, or their anguish. So, I, like, those women, I just felt that they did that whenever I listened to their music. Hmm. So, yeah, that's where I inspire for my singing, to have that type of type of voice. Okay, so how would you describe your voice, like, the color or the texture of your um, um, voice? My voice, I would say it's kind of, um, it has that strong um, sense more like a I hope that like my voice I would like hear myself all the time but like I've never heard like someone co- like comment on my voice but I feel like my voice is that strong um you like you get to feel the emotion that's what I try I try to be as emotion well as emotional as possible when I sing um I think it has such a like a heavy color to it um but I'm also uh like to do like soft tones but not as much because I don't feel like that's where I fit in, like, music-wise. Um, but it's definitely it's one of those voices, well, my goal is, is just one of those voices that's just out there. Like, when you hear me sing, like, you know it's me. Okay. Yeah. And so do you sing on the spot, or are you a little shy about that? I mean, could you sing something for us now, or um, would you want to rehearse something first? <laughs> <laughs> more with that, I like to rehearse it at first, okay. just because um, one of the things, again, there's, like, so many things that help hold me back. And it's, like, my singing, where, like, I love singing in private, but in public, especially on the spot, it's just like, oh, what can I sing? Like, what can I do? Right, right, right. So, yeah, so it's just definitely getting older, especially if I see myself in the industry. I definitely, have, like, have to loosen up a little bit, like, my voice, whether I, like, want to or not, 
is going to be heard eventually because that's the goal. Okay. Um, so definitely uh, would like to rehearse some stuff. Um, not so good on the spot, but yeah. Okay, well then maybe we'll hear something in the future. Yeah. Okay, so I want to, you know, just keep that uh, in in mind. Yeah. You know, because I'd love to hear something. And so let's go back to what you're talking about with sound engineering. So I'm really impressed with that because you mentioned logic. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know if you were able to listen to the seminar, if you can call it that, Mm -hmm. that took place this week, the announcement from Apple. Did you hear about the changes that are coming to Logic. Yeah, I heard. And, and uh, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I'm actually excited. I like loved Logic from the beginning. I started uh, watching, well, playing in GarageBand, and GarageBand was, you know, okay, I can like test that out. But I love Logic because Logic is so like for someone who wants to create their own music, I recommend Logic because it just gives you that um, that like. Like, let's say, for example, Logic is a canvas, and it gives you, like, all this paint. Like, you have all these sounds and all these plugins that you're able to use, and you are able to create, like, so... You have so much variety on, on like, a song, and, like, no song will sound the same when you use Logic. Um, Definitely, I'm looking forward to the new changes. Actually, again, I use Logic at home, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think Logic is just one of those that, like, helps you, like... Um, create new sounds and they're like okay what can we do to help the person create a new different sound even better sound because the music business is growing technology is growing as well and the music business and technology kind of go hand in hand and they do go hand in hand with like streaming and like making your own music so I'm very very excited and looking forward to that so the version of Logic that you have at home how many tracks maximum have you used and Uh, how many do you expect to use in the so future. the maximum that I've used was six. Um, I think the maximum that Logic lets you use, I think it's twenty four. I could be wrong. I just never like expanded to it so much to like see where it would go. But I've used like six, and most of them would just be um, a couple of drum patterns, and then I would add like. I really like horns, so I would add, like, horns and stuff. I really love piano, so I know, like, a couple chords, so I would add piano to it. Um, But, yeah, but Logic is uh, similar to uh, Pro Tools. Uh, Again, I think the most that they can do would be the 24 channels. It could be more, but, yeah. That's what I was thinking, too, that it was somewhat limited. But according to this, and you can listen back to it. I think they put it on the Apple Mm -hmm. website. Mm -hmm. But... If I heard them correctly, they said something about a thousand. Oh wow! So that's really <laughs> expanded. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what the average person, if the average person uses only six tracks to compose and layer and so forth. But imagine what a thousand tracks. I'm like, who would use a thousand tracks? But that's encouraging, yeah. I guess, to someone that thinks they could layer that many sounds. I, oh yeah. I don't know. I would love to see that at work. So yeah. who knows? I mean. You may end up using way more. Than you <laughs> yeah, think. yeah. So, so you mentioned your work in the community and and what you're doing as a salesperson, and and so I kind of want to touch on that a little bit because here on the podcast we talk about music making and wellness. You, as you know, I try to teach on a podcast, which is new for me, mm-hmm. and so I just want to know what trends are you seeing when it comes to music making? You're around it all the time. You're working with people that come in to maybe purchase an instrument or rent an instrument or they're interested in lessons, but what are some of the trends that you're seeing in in music making, in your opinion? Uh, Some trends that I see is definitely, um, especially like with selling instruments, I see that trend of uh, the difference in sound. Uh, Definitely like for us, for music and arts, we rent out instruments, and what we do uh, after a couple of years, most students, we recommend them to go to the step up. So basically, it's definitely testing that different uh, between a student level and a step up instrument. For example, in the clarinet case, plastic versus wood. Uh, tr- in trombones, uh, a straight trombone versus like a trigger trombone. 
So um, I noticed that as well. Another music trend I noticed with kids is definitely um, they have more, they're more comfortable with their sound and they are more confident when they play the instrument versus like the first time they're just like, oh, um, I'm going to test this out, see how uh, I like it. And then they're like a little shy hitting the first note, but now you see a lot more confidence and I see a lot of improvisation. Like some kids, we use recommend for kids to test out the instrument playing the scale or the or a piece. But then I see some students just like improvising and playing like whatever um, comes to their head, just because again they're confident in the um, in the instrument. There are some other cases that I've seen where it's just a student just gets another instrument just to get it. They don't really seem committed to it. Um, there's that's that trend that I've seen. Um, what else? I'll just, you know, just, just let me just interject here because I, I think it's so interesting. You have a really strong handle on the acoustic side mm-hmm. of music making, but yet you're also on the digital side of music making. And so when you see that student, like you said, that may not be so committed to playing the acoustic instrument, does it ever go through your head, well, maybe you should try digital music making? Does it ever go through your head, you know, that student maybe should try to shift the way that they make music. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, there's so many soft, you know, different versions of software out there mm-hmm. that will let you make music on the spot, never even having touched an instrument. What are your thoughts? Oh, well, that is a great question. I feel like not a lot of kids know of that. Like uh, most kids won't know about like that they can make their own music digitally until like their teens, or if they have families of that have musical backgrounds, that have worked in recording record labels or recording studios, and they have used digital. So usually a lot of kids, um, when they come into the store and they see just the instruments, I think the only thing they have in their head is like, oh, I can only play acoustically. But we also offer, like, uh, we also sell, like, mini keyboards and, and, like, drum pads and all that stuff. And I think it's just so new to them because they don't have the experience. And a lot of schools don't go through the digital route. They just go straight to like orchestra, um, band, do the acoustical sound. So I think it would be really cool, especially with like the um, the music business, like technology growing, it would be cool to see elementary schools and middle schools do like a small like digital music class where students are allowed to play on like a MIDI keyboard and record their own music. Because maybe we can get more kids that are like, oh, I don't want to play a saxophone, but I like making saxophone beats or, like, playing the saxophone on, like, a controller and recording my own music. Because it's, uh, using the the MIDI controller is, like, similar to the keys of a piano. Um, and it's just, like, hitting a note and it makes a note, too. And it just makes it, I feel like, for those who don't want to, like, delve with so much keys, they can just, like, make a chord or just play a note and, like, do a melody and they don't have, like, that pressure that, oh, you have to blow or you have to, like, use a reed to play or use, a like, a mouthpiece and all that stuff. So I think it would be really cool if, like, schools would do that. Right, right. So you see the benefits of both. Yeah. So let's talk about, you mentioned in the very beginning when we started talking that you play clarinet. Now, that I didn't know about you. And then you mentioned trombone. So can you say something about your experience with both instruments. They're both very different. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I played clarinet in elementary school. It was only for a year. Um, Playing clarinet was very, I think, was, like, kind of tricky for me. Um, Just because when you play a clarinet, like, your fingers have to be precise on, like, the holes, and you have to make sure, like, you're hitting all the right notes and all that stuff. However, when I switched to trombone, I felt like that was, like, the easiest for me because all you do have to do is just slide the trombone and then, like, uh, moving your um, mouth will change, like, the tone or the pitch. And it's just, like, a lot of people, I feel personally, a lot of people underestimate the trombone because they just see, like, the slide. Like, you can't make all these notes, but you have, like, an unlimited amount of possibilities, just like a trumpet. You only see, like, the three valves, but you can play so many notes with just those three. Mm -hmm. That's what I say with, like, the trombone. So if I had to pick the two, I would love to go back to trombone just because I love I love the sound. My favorite scale because of the trombone is the B flat scale. Okay. So um, just because playing it and I enjoyed it a lot. And definitely, definitely, definitely would like, if I were to repeat my like music career, like when I started, I would do trombone and I would play for like 
five years even more. So, yeah. Right. And so I just want to ask last, one last question, of, and that's about your education. So you mentioned college. Can you say more about your college education? Yeah, so my college education, I went to the University of New Haven up in Connecticut. Um, so again, study music and sound recording, and I really loved that program because it was so hands-on. Like, it wasn't, they taught you something, you take a test and that's it. So I took a bunch of studio recording classes, and in those studio recording classes are major projects where you have to create your own um, recording. They usually would say do a cover of a song or do an original. Um, at that time, because I didn't have an original, I would just do like covers of songs. And basically they told us, this is how you use the board. Now record your own stuff and we're going to grade you on that. And I love that because it definitely gave you like that um, individuality. Like you're able to create your own thing from scratch, even if it's just a cover of a song. Like a cover can be interpreted in so many ways and can be so different from the original, but still have that like same um, aspect or taste to it. So I really enjoyed doing that. Um, I know another thing from my music industry class, we actually took a field trip to one of the uh, mastering studios in New- that was in New York. Uh, the studio was called Sterling Sound. Um, and we were able to talk to one of the engineers, and they gave us like so inf- so much information on how they master a song, what are tips and tricks before you send a song to uh, mastering. And uh, my last semester, I did um, an internship with a studio center. So they weren't a music re- uh, company. They're more of a studio that worked with voiceovers and commercials. But you still had the same aspect of how to work a board. You still had to use Pro Tools. You still had to use, like, record on mics and all that stuff. So what I really enjoyed about that internship was the fact that, it was, though it wasn't music-related, it still taught me stuff that I learned in school. I was able to apply what I learned in school in the internship. So, mm-hmm. yep. Oh, great, great. Well, Christina, thank you so much for your time. I know you're a very busy young lady. <laughs> so thank you so much. We're going to... I think we're going to call this a conversation with Christina. And you're definitely invited back because I want to hear you sing. I think it would be great for the listeners to hear you. But it's been a great pleasure to speak with you. I think you're such an inspiration. And to quote an artist that talks about the music that women make, they say, I'm constantly cheering on the new generation of women musicians, telling them, represent as well, be a strong force, be excellent at what you do and go take over the world. And I think you're doing that. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'll see you next time. See you next time.